seven doctrines. And these seven doctrines is what separates a Christian church from the religions of the world. Paul, being the missionary of missionaries, uh, discovered this as he left the area of Jerusalem uh, and um, from the land of promise and got out there into the world of religions in uh, Gentile nations. And he discovered there were seven doctrines that separated them. Now, there are many more, but Paul listed seven. And so we've been doing a study of these seven doctrines. We've studied the one body, and we're studying the one spirit. Now, I settled down on a mini-series on the one spirit because there are two advents under the new covenant, two there are three advents that are important. It involves two members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It involves two of them. The first advent and the second advent is about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. The Son of God coming into the world. The other advent that is of great importance out of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit. The advent of the Holy Spirit. There is a lot of dis disinformation regarding that. And so Paul, uh, trying to clear that whole thing up, talks about one. So what I did, I felt like it was important to settle down and talk about the advent of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, want to talk about, I want to talk about nine specific characteristics of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit because this is the dispensation. The church age is the dispensation of the indwelling phenomenal ministry of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just think about this. At the moment of salvation, the moment a person believes that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the third day, according to Paul, that is the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The moment he believes that, Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16, that the gospel, that gospel I just explained to you, is the power of God unto sal the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The moment that person believes the gospel is the source of his salvation through Christ, the Holy Spirit converts him. Another way of looking at this phenomena is called regeneration. The Holy Spirit regenerates you. In fact, at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit does eight works in a believer's life that he never did in another dispensation that's recorded. It is recorded for us under the new covenant. And what I'm talking about is one of those, one of those eight works of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When it does occur, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 2 says, it occurs at the point of salvation. It is what brings you into a complete, holy relationship with God. We call it also regeneration. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence at the point of salvation in your life, your body, your human body, your mortal body, becomes the naos, the temple of God, the place where the blood of Christ put the presence of God with the believer. Did you hear that? The inner sanctuary. Your body's called the naos. And verse 20 says this, and you need to listen to this because most of you do not agree with God on this. I'm saying 99.9% .9 of you don't agree with it. Your body's not your own. Oh, it sounds good in theology. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the reality of personal choices that you make, you don't believe that. Because you make choices in your life that contradict that. Your body is not your own. It has been purchased through the gospel, the death of Christ. It's been purchased through the blood of Christ to make it a naos. What makes your body the temple of God is the blood of Christ. Part of that gospel, he dies on a cross, he's buried, and he's raised from the dead. Romans 8, chapter, verse 1 says that the, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, resurrection, lives inside your mortal body. 
Now, if I could get you to really believe that and make choices in your life that your body doesn't belong to you and you can't do with it whatever you want to do with it, then these nine characteristics of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit could have a powerful impact upon your life. It will not have a powerful impact on your life if you can't believe what I've just told you. Then what I'm, what I'm teaching you is going in one ear and out the other because you're not buying in. And Paul is the one who wrote all this. And he says this is very important that you understand this and begin to apply this to your daily living. It's called the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, I'm down when I did this series on the nine characteristics of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I put them in sets of three. I didn't design to do it. The, the Holy Spirit designed to do it. I thought I would just cover the nine of them and push on. He broke, made me stop. And last week I only got, now I'm in seven, eight, and nine, the last three that I want to discuss. And the reason I chose these nine is because Jesus taught them in John 14, 15, and 16. Say John 14, 15, and 16. Say it. John 14, 15, and 16. Look, I, it's important that you understand that. Where does this teaching, Je, this was Jesus preparing his disciples for him leaving and the Holy Spirit coming. He said, if I don't go, and listen what he said in, in John. He said in John 14, 15, 16, he says, it is to your advantage that I go away and leave you so that the Holy Spirit can come and take my place. It's an enormous ministry. And so last week I talked about number seven on your paper. That's last week. All I did was change the top and a few things to bring this lesson back to you. I'm in number eight now. I'm in number eight. Ernie covered, my, covered, covered you confessing your sins, right? All right. Then let's get on our study. I'm in, I'm in the eighth characteristics of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Watch this now. If you have your Bibles, I'd rather put your eyes on it. If you'll open to John 16, I'd like, I'd like people to see where it's found in their Bible and actually turn pages. Now, I know you got a cell phone, and I know you can just take your finger and do it. And I know all that. But in John 16, 13, and this is really important in my study today, Jesus gave the Holy Spirit a ministry title. Now, this is the second one he's given us in John 14, 15, and 16. If you recall that the first title he gave the Holy Spirit was comforter or helper. The word comforter is the best translation of the Greek word. And we talked about what his ministry is in your life to comfort you. Listen, you have the number one comforter in the universe living inside you. And Jesus, Jesus says this, when the comforter comes. Now, the second title that Jesus gives the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, 16 is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. I wrote on your paper, John 14, 17, John 15, 26, and John 16, 13. Well, showing you that this was a title of ministry that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit when he would come into the world in these passages. In these passages, he is identified as the spirit of truth. Now, look what John 16, 13 says. And when... That's Dehoten plus the subjunctive mood. But when, now, the word day conjunction is a trailer hitch. When you find that, either Kai, Day, or Allah, these are conjunctions like a trailer hitch. In other words, you are, you are forced to go back into the context of what has just recently be, been said. So let's go to 5, 6, and 7. Let's go to 5 and 6. 
and then because I'm reading seven. And, and then we'll, we'll drop back down to 13. He says in verse 5, And now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me where you're going. But because I've said these things about him going to Jerusalem, being crucified, being buried, and raised from the dead on the third day, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. That's why you need, listen, when sorrow fills your heart is when you need the comforter. And do you have one? Listen, not only do you have one, listen to me now, you have the one. <laughs> you don't just have a comforter, you have the one comforter. When he comes, and then he gets into a discussion that takes us down to verse 13 about the conviction work of the Holy Spirit in the world. And then verse 13, but when he comes, say, that's the idea of verses 5, 6, and 7. See, look at verse 8, and when he comes. Please tell me you see that. 5, 6, 7. And when he comes, verse 8, and when he comes. Now we got dropped down to verse 13. He comes back to the subject. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, he, 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 he's in the same thing, talking about, I've got to go, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and when he comes, he's going to do this with the world, and he's going to do this with those in the world that believe the gospel, that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. He's going to introduce them to the dynamics of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot live the Christian life apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit. You cannot do it. It's not to be lived in the flesh, it's to be lived in the Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So here's what he says in verse 30. He comes back to the subject. But when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, but he, notice this time he calls him the Spirit of truth. Because what he's going to tell you is essential for you to understand when he's the Spirit of truth. When is he the Spirit of comforter? When sorrow has filled my heart. You think you're going to have a lot of those experiences? Uh, if, you ha if your life has any meaning for Christ, you're going to have a lot of it. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose family members uh, for the cause of Christ, for your, for your cause of Christ. Now, when, the, when he's called the spirit of truth because his ministry is going to do a phenomenal work in your life, and he's going to talk about it in the rest of this part. He says, but he, the spirit of truth, this is the emphasis, comes, watch this now, he will guide you. There's number eight. He will guide you into what? All truth. He will guide you. When I was a young guy going to college, I was down here going to UAB, working days, going to school at night, paying my own way through, hoping to get scholarships, trying to get into dental school, hoping I could make it. I got a job with Southern Natural Gas, walking what they call walking pipeline. About a dollar and a quarter an hour, and I was glad to have a job. I was in my third year of college, over my third year of college, came down here to spend a year so I wouldn't have to pay out-of-state tuition. And I had two uncles who lived here that worked for, one worked for Southern Natural Gas, got me a job immediately. I lived with him going to school. And they put you, when you walk the, tra when you walk the pipeline, they put you with an experienced piper, gas piper guy. We called them pipers. These were old vets. You walked, you walked from mile marker, airplane mile markers. And those mile markers is how you kept up with any kind of leaks on the field or any problems going on the, on the fairway. The, you're familiar with that. Well, this old boy that they gave me, was named, his name was Wormy. 
You know, if you work in the industry, they, everybody, nobody knows your real name. I was called Little Yankee when I was there. Nobody ever knew my name. I never knew. I, one day, Jane and I were out, and I saw him. I didn't even know how to introduce him. I introduced him as Wormy. And my wife went, hmm. He was a wonderful guide for me because he taught me what to look for uh, at gas leaks, how to work the mile markers, how to cross streams, don't lift up rocks for any reason, look for water moccasins and rattlesnakes, two things I didn't know anything about coming out of Michigan. And he would tell me how far I had to walk to be met to have lunch. And I would have lunch, and then I'd walk mile markers until I could be through at three. So it was interesting. You know what he was? We called them pipers. You know what they call? You know what the company called them? Guides. And boy, that, were you ever essential? You were a first responder to gas leaks, gas leaks, and things of that nature. And you took good records, and you filed it, and you came back, and yada yada. We were, he was called a guide, a guide. And that's exactly the word that's used here, a guide. I wrote down on this paper of you the Greek word. And, and I want you, there are four times, watch this now, four times the future active indicative is used. When he comes, this is what he's going to do in the future. He's got to come, and this is what he's going to do. He put, he put four of them in the future tense because why did he put it in the future tense? Listen to me. Because it's not going to happen until Jesus goes back into session. He's got to leave the earth and go back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father or the Holy Spirit doesn't come. But when he comes, it's going to be to your advantage because one among many things he's going to do is going to be your guide. He's going to be your piper. He's going to be your guide. He's going to teach you how to walk the walk, not just the talk. He's going, to talk. He's going to teach you how to walk through the Christian life. He's going to be a guide. And you know what? Daily. Daily. And, and so this is a one of it. It means to lead the way for you to follow. To lead the way for you. And, he, and listen, he's going to teach you the truth about your path. Your right away. We call that the right away. He's going to teach you how to walk it. He's, he's going to do what? Guide. He's going to be a tour guide. He's going to be a mountain guide. Whatever you're in. If you're, if you're in the water, he's a water guide. If you're in the mountain, he's a mountain guide. He's going to be your guide in life. And what, what's his purpose? Spirit of truth. The spirit of truth, the spirit of truth will guide you into what? Some truth, right? Oh, how important is it is for you to study the Bible under the ministry of the Holy Spirit? How is it important for you to teach under the ministry of the Holy Spirit? It's essential. Because it falls under the, the guidance of the spirit of truth into all truth. And so he says he will guide you, you, he will guide you into all the truth. Not just some of it, all of it. Isn't that interesting? All of it. You know who you should ask when you say, well, I wonder what the Bible says about so-and-so. You ought to talk to the resident counselor in your life. <laughs> you got the one who will guide you into all the truth, right? Yeah, look outside. You got one inside. All he wants to do is hear the question. What about such and such? I wonder what the Bible says about it. He'll give you so much information, you could write a book on it. He will guide you into all the truth. Watch this now. It gives a negative and a positive. Watch this now. He will not speak of his own initiative. He will not speak on his own initiative. That's one thing he will never do. That's a strong ook. O-U-K is a strong negative in the Greek. 
But, now watch this. Whatever he hears a cool, he will speak. Guess who's telling him what to tell you about truth? God the Father, who is in charge of this whole program. Well, what's the Bible say? Because what, when you ask questions like, what's the Bible say about dating? Or what's the Bible say about marriage? Or what's the Bible say about career? What's the Bible say about it? And sometimes it's a very, sometimes it's a very broad thing. You go like, well, I don't know if I can find anything. Great. Well, it can tell you about how you should be, how you should be on your job. You say, yeah, but what, what is my job? Well, who? who who do you suppose knows that? Let me tell you who knows it for sure. Let me tell you who knows it for sure. You ought to pay attention to this. I'm going to tell you who knows it for sure. God. Your heavenly father, your daddy, your God. And you know when he, and listen, he wrote it down in eternity past. Now all you got to do is bring it out in time. And guess who's your guide on what? What should be my vocation? I went through that struggle. I went through it. You know how I settled it? The same way I'm telling you. I know as a believer in the gospel of Christ that I have a new life before I got saved. I had my own ambitions. I knew exactly what my ambitions and aspirations were, and I was on target for it. When I got saved, when I got that, that whole deal changed. I was under a different guide. And I thought I would stay and pursue what I'd already started, and he kept choking me down on it and saying, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. I've got a whole new plan for you that I, you had to get saved to get involved in. Now, let me encourage you. Not everybody's going to go into ministry. Not like I am, like a PT or something. Everybody, listen to me though, everybody's going into ministry. When you get saved, everybody, everybody gets a spiritual gift for the church. Everybody's an ambassador for Christ. Everybody's a priest. The 20 status privileges is who you are in Christ. In that little booklet, 50 things. But I'll tell you what you do get at the point of salvation is very important to your vocation and where, where God wants to push your life in ministry is the guide. The Holy Spirit is your guide in it. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. You will not make a mistake if you'll pay attention to this. He's going to, uh, if, listen, because when you go, I don't know whether I should be this or that. They go like, listen, here's what you can be confident. Listen, just settle down. He, here's what he's going to say to your soul. Here's what he's say to your human spirit. I got it. Because you're going to say to him, I want your guidance counselor, right? You go to college, they give you guidance counselor, right? They used to. They still do that. Josh, they give you a guidance yeah? counselor. You have to ask for him? Forget that. How come you have to do that when the family can't have anything to do with them in college? I don't know, but anyhow, you know what I mean. We have that in here. It's okay to ask the guy out there because he's running the show out there. But the person you ought to ask whether you ought to be doing this or ought to be doing that or ought to be doing that is the Holy Spirit because he is your guide counselor. And he's going to tell you, he's going to tell you what the Father tells him that has been set in stone in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. Listen, you say, well, I don't know what I want to do. I just try to go from job to job to do this, to do that. St still applies to you. Your life is not your own. And you don't want it to be your own. You don't want it to be your own. You want, it, you want him to guide you. That's when a job that sucks has ministry. When you change your idea about it, I hate my job. What are you talking about? It beats food stamps. I don't know. 
<laughs> it does for your well-being. Check with your guidance counselor. It's what he's there for. What, he, what will he do? He's called the spirit of truth. When he guides you, he's called the spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all truth. Do you have any idea how powerful that is? And listen, you need to remember, when you know that he gave you the vocation you're in, and you know that you're in the place that he wants you to be, do you know how wonderful that is to know that? So stop complaining about it and start embracing it as a great place of ministry. He's, listen, if you're in education, he's going to give you some of the screwiest kids you ever saw in your life because they come from screwiest parents you've ever seen in your life. And God has circled the wagons in order for you to touch their little lives in a powerful way just for a season. If you've got a, a, a job out there, I, I don't care what it is, and you start complaining about it. What you're complaining about is why God puts you there. It's the powerful ministry that's there. They're called problems, and they're called people, and they're called people problems. And we're more than equipped. We just have to switch our attitude, and we do by letting the guide for all truth guide us. Let him guide you. You will be, listen, take your problems and turn them into blessings. That's what God wants to do. Figure out a way. The very things that just stir you up and, and say to you, I wish I hadn't, I wish I hadn't. No, look, there's not a better job. God has placed you in the most strategic time in the most strategic place. Embrace it. Embrace it for ministry. Now, I know, I know it can get me taxing, but listen, you're, you don't have to be the guide. You've got a guide that's supernatural, that is God himself. Why, why not take advantage? He, listen, he said when he comes, it will be to your what? Advantage. It will be to your advantage. That's a different attitude change, right? That's all we're talking about here. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak all that in the future tense of why he's coming and how he operates. This part, this is part of what 1 John 2, 20 and 27 called the anointing ministry. That's part of that. Divine truth is based, listen to me, this is what's wonderful. He's called the spirit of truth. Agreed? That's 100% the essence of God. When he's called the spirit of truth, that's not relative. That's absolute. He is absolutely 100% 100, 100 truth. Well, not everybody gets a chance to get their picture taken by God. You see? I get mine taken often here. So, one of the ten care essence of God is veracity. God is truthful. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. Think about that. I can lie in a heartbeat, right? God can't be, he can't lie at any time for any reason ever. It's called veracity. I put it on your paper if you need a reference, like Hebrews 6.18 and Titus 1 through 3. Just think about that. Absolute truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you, not just into truth, but into absolute truth. 100% foolproof. <laughs> 100% foolproof, baby. How good is that? 100%. You ought, you ought to be a priest of that. L listen to Psalms 110, 160. Can you imagine that? I'm, at, I'm in Psalms 119. I'm at verse 160. That's a long one, isn't it? He says, 
the sum of your word, the writer says, the sum of your word. How could I, what one word could sum up the whole word of God? What one word would sum up the whole Bible? You know what he, called, what he said? Truth. Veracity. One word. Veracity. And we have the author of that, the spirit of truth, living inside our mortal bodies, ready to work for you, ready to work for you on behalf of the name of Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Why, <clears throat> Why would you not take advantage of that? Here's John 14, 20. Here's John 14, 20. In that day, advent of the Holy Spirit, that would be Pentecost, in that day, advent of the Holy Spirit, you will know, Gnosko, future act of addictive, that's the fifth one we've had in regard to the Holy Spirit, fifth one as the spirit of truth. The fifth, fifth future indicative, if you've been keeping up. In that day, advent of the Holy Spirit, you, the church age believer, will know, be able to recall, recall Bible doctrine as absolute truth for an absolute situation. You know how comforting that is when you finally decide what you're going to do in life? How comforting that is? Do you know how comforting that is when you find that soulmate for life? How comforting that is to know this is for life? You know how comforting it is to have salvation and the Holy Spirit say, you know, this is for life. I didn't save you for time. I saved you for eternity. I didn't save you for one day and it'll lose you. I've saved you forever. Because I am God, nothing slips through my fingers. Nothing. John 20, John 10, 28, 30. In that day you shall know, Godasco. This happened, listen, write this down. Write this down. This happened in Luke 24, 7 and 8 to the disciples after Jesus was raised from the dead, after Jesus was raised from the dead, they remembered his words. That's recall. Listen, that falls under the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Remember John 14, 26? I taught he teaches and recalls. I mean, how many times we're caught in a situation and we don't know and we're, we're ministering and, and our mind goes like, mm, I know a verse, I can't, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, I got it. See, if you just relax, don't get up tight, just relax. Let the Holy Spirit give the truth out. And he does it. And listen, we, we're like sitting in the bleachers. When he comes and lays that truth out there for us, we go like, whoa, that was good. <laughs> that was really good. And we know that didn't come from us because we were scrambling and it come out, and it just come out just as sweet and just as perfect. That's the guidance ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful tool you have that you're not using. This is the most powerful tool, and you're not using it. Why is that possible? Here's the ninth characteristic. Wow, I might make this. Here's the ninth characteristics of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Watch this now. Now I'm in the 16th chapter. And he's going to say this word three times, 13, 14, 15. And when you see him tell you something that many times, it's a marker. Here is the thing he says, he, he's guide and disclose. Guide and disclose. The spirit of truth will guide and, dispo, and disclose. Watch this. Here's verse, verse 13. And, and he will disclose... Future active indicative, he's got to come first. Jesus has got to go, he's got to come. He will disclose to you, watch this now, watch this, what is to come. You know what you worry about a great deal? What is to come? I'm a junior, I'm a junior, what am I going to do? I'm not quite sure if I should be here or should be there. Have you got a guide? Have you got a good counselor guide? He lives inside you. Come on. Will he guide you? Is that his job? Of course it's his job. Just guide him. Big things and all things. 
Some truth or all truth? Some truth or all truth? All right. I'm just asking. I'm just asking. He will disclose. Here's the ninth characteristic. The indwelling Holy Spirit will disclose to every believer what is to come. And listen, what's the point? What is his point? In the future tense, Jesus got to go back home, and the Holy Spirit has to come. And from that point till the return of Christ, from the point of the Holy Spirit leaving, uh, the Lord leaving, and the Holy Spirit coming, the advent of the Holy Spirit, right? From that point to the second coming of Christ is this period what is to come. Everything in your life in the church age, everything in the church life, everything in the church age, in the ch life of the believer of the church, why right? the church is not a building, it's people, converted people, people, born again people. Everything between the advent of the Holy Spirit and the end of the church age is what we're talking about. And you're involved in that. You're a generation that's essentially important in this period your generation, you can only minister to yours, or unless you're lucky, you can minister to several generations before you get out of here. I'm looking for a bunch of them. Yeah, I want to minister to a lot of generations. I didn't come just to, to minister to one generation. I want to minister to a lot of them. But I can tell you, I'm ministering under the umbrella of what is to come. And say, I'm that way right now. I'm in that. I'm under that umbrella of what is to come. I say, Father, I'm ready to go someplace else. And he goes like, the Holy Spirit says, well, I'm ready for you to do. But I got, I'm under, listen, I don't know. I tell you when I hear it, right? Come on, tell, tell me you know that. I'll tell you when I'm, when I'm told to tell you. Think about that. Well, I'd like to know now. And he said, look, I would like to tell you, get off, so you quick get off this. You're bugging me. I can't tell you until I'm told, right? So be calm about it, Ron. Just take, just get calm. It's okay. See? All in God's time, not yours. Okay. So, watch that. He, he will disclose to you what is to come, right? Now, I'm not talking about out, outside in eternity. I'm not talking about eschatology. I'm talking about what is to come in the framework of the coming of the Holy Spirit until Christ returns, right? Now, he certainly can show you things beyond that, but that's not what he's talking about because we're talking about the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in that dispensational period. That's my opinion. <clears throat> listen what he says. This is, listen, listen, he says in verse 14, he will glorify me. Watch this, thir watch this 14. He will glorify me, Christ. The Holy Spirit will not glorify himself, and he certainly won't glorify you. <laughs> But he certainly will glorify Christ. And you know, one of the ways he does it is to be a guide. And the second way is to disclose to you things. He will disclose to you. He will guide and disclose things to you that glorify Christ. And when he does, you can't help talking about him. You can't help thinking about him. I think about Christ all the time. I think about him all the time. I think about him as the head of the church, the savior of the body, my guide on. I think about, I think about Jesus Christ all the time. I, sp I spend a little time thinking about the Holy Spirit, except in his function. When my, sor when my heart fills with sorrow, I know where to go. I have the Holy Spirit. I just go, I go immediately in my, in, in my decision processing. I'm going to go to the Holy Spirit, but why? Because he's the greatest comforter of all comforters that you could ever have is the comforter of the Holy Spirit. And he, his, his ministry is to comfort my heart in ways that nobody else could ever know how to comfort me. 
And listen, he's on, he's on assignment from God to make sure he meets my needs in a way that honors God and honors the Lord. It's a powerful idea. I'm just suggesting it to you as, as Jesus explained it. He will glorify me. Well, now watch this. That's the first part of this. Watch the second part. He will take of mine and disclose it to you. Listen, that's not only the teachings of Christ, but it is the ministry of Christ who is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. When you look at spiritual gifts, for example, you will see that all three members of the Godhead have a responsibility to your spiritual gift. God has a responsibility. The Holy Spirit has a responsibility. The Lord has a responsibility. And if you want to see how all that works, you ought to pay attention to 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 5, and 6. They all have a key role in your life. All three members of the Godhead are at work in your life, and I don't know that you give them any credit or any acknowledgement. You think you're, well, it's my life, and, uh, you know, well. Maybe it's his life. Maybe it's his life in you that makes your life significantly important. What do you think about that? Maybe it's not about all about your life. Maybe it's about your life as you surrender it into the Lord. Maybe that's the key. Well, at least that's what he's talking about in verse 14. Listen to this in verse 15. Listen to verse 15. All things. <laughs> Don't change that. Don't be saying some things. That's what, that's what we all like to do. We read the Bible, it says all things, and then we live it some things. If you're going to live it, live it like it said, because that's the high ground. All things that the Father has, present active indicative, are mine, Christ said. Now watch, this, watch the sequence of ideas here. Therefore, because of this, that's what therefore means, because of this, I said, Lego, that's a second heiress form. I say that to you because a second heiress form of Lego puts the emphasis on the substance of what is being said. There's no way you can see that in the English translation. There's no way that rings a bell. Because of this, I said... And he wants, to rec wants you to recall the substance. He's saying to the disciples, recall the substance of what I have said to you. What I said, aorist active indicative, I've already taught that to you. Pay attention to the substance. What was point one? What was point two? What was the first point? I'm going to Jerusalem. What was the second point? I'm, I'm going, to be, uh, going to be cruelly placed in, in unbelievers' hands. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to be buried on the third day, raised from the dead. That's the substance of what he's been teaching. See, the substance. Therefore, because of this, I said that, Hote, here's what he's declaring. He said, I'm going to boil it down into a nutshell. I don't know what that means, but I'm boiling it down into a, a substance point. I'm boiling the substance of what I said down into an idea. He takes of mine, the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, will take of mine and disclose it to you. Now watch this. Circle the word, on your paper, circle the word Father. Then circle the word mine and circle the word you. Because you see it goes... He, the f disclosure comes from the Father through the Holy Spirit, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit to the believer. It goes from the Father through the Son, through the Holy Spirit to you as a church age believer. Yeah? I just wanted you to circle the sequence. If you can't circle it, just write it. <laughs> the sequence. All things that the Father has are mine. That's a transfer. 
And just as I have previously told you and restate to you, the Holy Spirit will take mine. The Father gave it to me. The Holy Spirit will now take what's been given to me under his watch and now disclose it to you. Do you see the you on your paper? Put your name there. Let's get personal. Put your name there. The Father, everything, all things that the fa of the Father, he's given to me. All that, all those things. The Holy Spirit, taking my place, has the authority over these things. Right? We'll give it to you. All things. You don't want to miss any of that. Dear people, you do not want me. And so I said this word disclose. It will disclose what is to come. The teaching of divine truth of Christ and disclosing to the church age believer your whole life. You don't have to go through your life wondering, oh, if I made a good choice. Yeah. Look, you got, a, you got a guide counselor who will disclose to you all the things that God has planned, has put it into Christ, and the Holy Spirit takes those things put into Christ and puts it into the believer. You need to have it all. Why would you settle for less than all? I didn't let it. He said all things. Why would you settle for less than all things? And so I laid, that, laid this out and how it, how it comes positionally to us. So here's, what, here's how I'm going to close it out. Here's how we're going to close it. I'm going to offer you two prayers. Here's the first prayer I'm going to offer you. Here, here's the prayer I'm going to offer you. Father, teach me to seek the guidance of the indwelling Holy Spirit into all your truth, into all areas of my life. Does that ring a bell? I mean, does that ring a, a bell in your little soul? I mean, your soul got like, well, I need that. Then hold it. I'm going to offer you another prayer. Father, teach me to allow the indwelling Holy Spirit to disclose to me the things to come to my life and not to rely on my own answers. Either one of those ring a bell. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. I'm going to pray that first prayer again, if that's your prayer. You make some acknowledgement to God that that's my prayer. Listen to this prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, teach me to seek the guidance of the indwelling Holy Spirit into all your truth, into all areas of my life. And do not let me rely on my own efforts to achieve it. Here's the second one. Father, teach me to allow the indwelling Holy Spirit to disclose to me the things to come to my life so that I might not rely on my own answers for them. Because you don't. The Holy Spirit will guide and disclose. This is his ministry, not yours. It's his to you. It's a gift. Accept that. Father, we're thankful for these prayers. You've certainly examined our heart and know what we need in it. Maybe we needed one, needed, we needed both, but we need the guidance and the disclosing ministry of the Holy Spirit in the relevance of truth of our life, for we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.